Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we appreciate everybody who's already uh, joining. Uh, we're gonna give it a couple minutes and let some more people join in and then uh, we will get moving. Um, in the meantime, uh, enjoy the beauty that is the three of us as you sit there and wait patiently. Which I'm sure is just riveting. Kind of soldier field there. <laughs> All right, we're still picking up a couple uh, couple attendees. We'll give it another minute or so, uh, let everybody get in, and then uh, we'll get moving. Again, we appreciate everybody joining us. Um, I think it's going to be very educational for a lot of you and maybe get some answers uh, close or uh, some answers for some of the questions you guys have had burning for a while. So a couple more minutes and we'll get moving. All right. I, uh, every time I go to start, I see like three or four more people jump in. So I'm, uh, it's awesome to see. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and, and kick things off. Uh, everybody, first and foremost, we want to thank you all again for joining us today for this edition of uh, the CTI Connect Fireside Chat. Uh, my name is Benton Cook. I'll be the moderator uh, referee for today. Um, hint the sweet digs. Um, for those of you not yet familiar with CTI, we are a premier distributor. We have two centrally located um, distribution fulfillment centers. Uh, we pride ourselves on serving our family of customers and partners with a new level of care and respect, um, as well as having uh, a lot of in-house expertise to hopefully get you guys soup to nuts what you need for your, uh, for your business needs. So um, today's chat is going to be all about hearing from our industry gurus in a very informal and chill manner. Uh, we'd like to hear from all of you today. So please, please, please ask questions. Um, the comments at the bottom, the, the Q&A at the bottom. We had a lot of good questions roll in before we got started, so we'll uh, try to sprinkle those in a little bit. But also, again, if you guys have questions, please um, put them in the chat bar, and I'll try to get to as many as I can in the time. Um, so uh, we're going to have time for questions at the end. Um, you know, the, the way we kind of plan this is we're going to try to hit some of the bullet points as far as the majority of the main concerns or questions people have regarding um, CBRS and 450. Um, but then at the end, we're, you know, we're going to try to do the majority of this as questions and you know, hear from y'all and, and get the answers you guys need. So um, game changing fiery topic today, CBRS. Um, our players today are going to be uh, Matt Kale, our internal expert and senior account manager, and uh, the wonderful and lovely Mr. Matt Mangriotis, who is the uh, Cambium uh, product manager for the 450 line, as well as others. Um, and this is going to be your problem solving team right here, guys. So um, Please, as, you, uh, as we continue to get going, please, please, please ask questions and we'll try to get to them. Uh, in the meantime, Matt, and we get it kicked off and uh, throw it over to you. Which Matt? You, oh, baby. Right. Matt, <laughs> Kale. There you go. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, this is, we want to keep this as much of an open forum as possible. Um, our previous fireside chat we had done with uh, Steve Kiley over at Cambium Networks, and there was a resounding amount of requests for uh, a follow-up specifically focused on CBRS and we just sat down and thought about it and there really isn't anyone else out there that we would want to do this besides Matt Mangriotis with Cambium um, who's the overall CBRS expert 
um, being on the Alliance and being the head of the 450 and uh, CN Ranger product line for Cambium that focuses on that frequency. Um, so that's kind of the open forum we want to have. Uh, please, please ask a ton of questions. Uh, we've got some that are already earmarked, but we're going to kind of start from soup to nuts. Um, so from the beginning, uh, CBRS, you know, if you don't know what it is, um, it's the three gigahertz frequency. There's additional spectrum that was recently released by the FCC. Uh, some of it was for general access and some of it was for priority access. Uh, the priority access bids have already happened. The auction has happened. So if you're finding out for this for the first time, then that spectrum is not going to be for you. But there is general access and general access spectrum. There's twice as much spectrum in this band as there was before. Um, and so it's, it's just a real exciting time right now for ISPs having spectrum that they can use. Uh, specifically, this band's really great for its super high transmit powers and also really well known because it gives you the ability with that higher transmit power to do some non line of sight hits. And in addition to all of that, you have some spectrum that the noise floor is a lot more quiet because it's not generally being used for Wi Fi access or traditional unlicensed uh, backhaul or anything like that. Um, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about your, your involvement with the whole CBRS thing and from on a very high level? Sure, sure. We've been uh, at Cambium here, we've been involved in CBRS for three and a half years and kind of aware of it for many years before that. Uh, but we've been a part of WinForum, which is the industry group that the FCC tasked to create the rules. Uh, we've been involved with that group for a number of years. And then when CBRS Alliance came around, we joined that group as well, another industry group. The CBRS Alliance, however, is kind of focused on uh, promoting the use of LTE in the band. Um, whereas the WinForum creating the rules is really concerned with the best use of the spectrum, regardless of the technology that's being used to do it. And so that's where we come in. Uh, Cambium Networks has uh, several different platforms for multi-point products, uh, but the current front runners are EPMP, which does not play in the 365 band or in the CBRS band, and then the 450 product line, which I manage. And that's, that's the product that's the kind of the flagship multi-point product for the uh, corporation. And then as well as the premier um, point to multi-point product in CBRS. So I can say with credibility and with uh, knowing that we are by far the market share leader in this band as of right now. Uh, we have a, a huge amount of devices that are operating in CBRS already. And we have a big install base of folks that are ready to transition or just getting ready to, to embark on this journey. Um, so we'll get into some of these questions about uh, why and the upcoming deadlines for sure. Uh, but if you were operating under what they used to call part 90, which was the 365 band previously, uh, and you have Cambium equipment, then the good news is that you can migrate that equipment over to part 96 with uh, software only. Uh, you don't need to do any truck rolls. You don't need to do anything different. You can now migrate everything uh, with software into part 96. Um, and I think actually that's a good place to start, Matt, because we did have a couple questions that came in beforehand um, about what are the steps to transition and then what happens if you choose not to transition? So that's a great question. So what's going on right now, and I think most people are aware if you had a, a, what they called an NN license, uh, there's an expiration date to that license. And what they did because of COVID and things, the FCC actually, the deadline was April 17, 2020 this year, uh, but because of the, the pandemic and all the things associated with it and the slowdown and, and the ability to do this transition, they actually pushed that deadline out to October 17th. So now, the NN deadline or the expiration of the um, part 90 use is now October 17, 2020. Now, some folks are out there going, well, I know I looked up my license uh, in the database and my expiration date is beyond 2020, uh, beyond April 17, 2020, or beyond October for that matter. Um, that may be the case. There are some exceptions to that rule. So there, there may be opportunity to continue to operate in, in part 90 beyond that date. But the vast majority of licenses that are out there, I think it's somewhere in the order of 85% of all licenses, will expire October 17, 2020, which means uh, that 
in theory, you need to not be using part 90 any longer. You need to have transitioned to part 96 uh, with whatever equipment you're using in the band. Now that equipment must be certified under part 96 to be able to be used under part 96. Again, good news from Cambium. If you're using Cambium stuff, it's easy to transition. Um, the steps to do so, we outline in several user guides. There's a standalone CBRS user guide, which probably may be the first place to look that's available on our download site. Um, we utilize CN Maestro to do this. Uh, it, it does require an instance of CN Maestro and we'll uh, by no, undoubtedly get into more details around that. Um, but you need CN Maestro. You need to be a, what they call a certified professional installer for part 96, which we'll, we'll probably get into some details around that as well. Um, so starting there, you can now begin that journey of, of transitioning. So just to, at a high level, CBRS is a great thing because as Matt mentioned, it expands the amount of spectrum that you can work with. You can now use 355 to 37, and whereas before you only had 365 to 37, only 50 megahertz. Now it's 150 megahertz. Those PAL licenses, the priority licenses that were auctioned off just recently closed, uh, several WISPs got them. I'm sure some of you guys on the call have some of those licenses in the counties that you operate. Um, if you didn't get in, that doesn't mean you're out of luck. That means that up to seven or seven of those uh, 15 channels available, seven out of the lower 100 megahertz, 70 megahertz of the lower 100 are now uh, licensed to someone who holds that priority license. Now, when they can start operating still a bit, a bit in the air, we expect probably on the order of December of this year to be able to start operating in those areas. All the SASs have to catch up and a SAS is the guys who administrate um, the spectrum allocation because it's dynamically shared spectrum, which means you're sharing among everybody who wants to use that spectrum. So I know I'm bouncing around a lot of places uh, here with CBRS because it's, it's not a super simple thing. Uh, but if you want to take advantage of using the 100 megahertz, the 150 megahertz, and you want to take advantage of this higher power and the ability to do near and non line of sight in some cases, uh, then you got to kind of deal with this complexity. Um, sure. But it's a, it's a great thing to have available for everyone. You know, I, I, when I always start out and I start talking to somebody to say, hey, if you're new to all of this, the very first thing I recommend you do is go get your certified professional installer training done, your CPI. Um, I think uh, there's a couple different courses. I think Comscope has one and Google has one. All of the, all of the SAS administrators uh, do their own. And there's yep. actually a couple beyond that that do it. So if, if whether you want to use Google, Comscope, or Federated Wireless, any of those big three, those, those are the known as the big three SAS administrators, all of them have their own training course. It does not matter whose training course you use. They all cover the same material and they will all certify you. Now you're, you're a bit tied to that entity uh, as they are the ones that kind of certified you but you mm -hmm. can use any of them to be your SAS provider. Uh, and, and through Cambium, we're your link to those guys. Uh, and you can choose any of those three to be your SAS provider when using Cambium equipment. Every, so, all the communication goes through our equipment and through Maestro, but you can choose any of those three, Federated Wireless, Google, or Comscope to be your sure. SAS administrator. And so, you know, I, I like the idea of people starting with the training because it gives you almost a full day of, everything you could ever want to know about this. Um, one of the questions that I, that I get a decent amount, um, you know, there's kind of a little bit of a misnomer that because it's the CPI, Certified Professional Installer, that every installer needs to have it, but it's only one person per company that needs to have that. And not necessarily even that. Uh, yeah. So just to kind of be clear about it from a law perspective or from a legal perspective, a CPI needs to what, sign off and install a certificate that signs off on every installation. So every radio that's out there has a digital certificate from a CPI installed in it. Mm -hmm. And that means that that name that's on there is the person responsible for that piece of equipment that's out there. And so if something happens where that thing is transmitting in an area that it shouldn't be or transmitting at a higher power than it should be, they go after the guy whose name is on there. It doesn't have to be someone in your company, in your service provider, WISP, or anything else. It, it can be someone that you hired. Uh, but, yeah. but generally, by and large, most folks want to have control over that. And so most folks will have at least one CPI on staff. But you don't have to. You can hire somebody to do that for you if you want. And I want to kind of go back to another thing that you, you very briefly touched on. Um, 
I know there was a specific date of the original license creation of anything past that date, your license expires on this October 17th. What, right. So, so a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things when they moved that or, or pushed the waiver from April 17th to October 17th, one thing that was made very clear, and I believe it was clause 15 in the document, and I, I, we can share that link uh, wherever we post this uh, webinar uh, to the document. But in that document, it clearly states that any license that is issued or renewed after January of 2013, and these are 10 year licenses, bear in mind, any license that was issued or renewed after January 2013 will expire October 17, 2020, regardless of what it says in the database as far as expiration date. So let me say that again, because it's very important that everyone understands this. So any license that was issued or renewed after January 2013 will expire October 17, 2020. Um, so if you have a license in your, in your database, in the ULS, you look up your, your uh, FRN or your, um, what do they call it, call sign number in, your, in the ULS, and it says 2024, 2026, that's not the case. Those licenses will expire October 17, 2020 for, all, for use of Part 90, which means you got to transition to Part 96. So you may be thinking that you have lots of time and you do not. Uh, so just bear that in mind. I want to make that 100% crystal clear. And, and Perfect, so Max. Say, that, like, was, yeah, that was one of our questions, actually, was a gentleman had asked about uh, his, his not expiring until 2024. So I'm glad you went over that. So real quick, um, I think that's a good little spot to stop real quick. Um, for the attendees, we are going to be doing three giveaways today, uh, three raffles. So I'm going to throw up a quick poll. Um, if you could please just fill out the, the answers for the poll. Um, and then from there, we'll be drawing a random winner. Uh, I will announce the winner probably just by first name, maybe last initial. We don't want to give everybody's secrets away. Uh, but then I'll be reaching out to you afterwards to get your contact information and shipping address uh, for a little um, tailgate prize pack that we have with the cooler and a couple other things. So I'm going to go ahead and put the poll up now. And if everybody could please do that real quick, we'll give it a minute or two. We'll do our drawing and then we'll keep it moving. I should fill this out so I get a chance to win. It says right on there, Matt, hosts and panelists cannot vote. Come yeah, on. It says it right there. Trying to take stuff away from your guests. Big red letters. <laughs> um, as as uh, Ben, would you like to, are we good to continue on? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think I think we can go from there. Um, you know, one of the things I think that, that you touched on, um, but maybe dive a little bit deeper. Somebody had asked, is CBRS right for a company that did not bid on a license? So, I think, you know, we've obviously talked about what the PAL license is, but let's say you didn't get the license. Is it still right for a company if they're not using it yet? Yeah. So it, again, I'm going to have a lot of opinions today and these are Matt's opinions. Um, well, I've been involved in it a long time, but these are my opinions. So I'm not going to, I hope no one holds me to their, their business model or anything like that. But uh, uh, if, if you did not win a license, if you did not win a PAL, that means that potentially as we mentioned, 70 megahertz of that 150 megahertz could be prioritized for someone else's use in your area. Um, it doesn't mean that it will be for sure, uh, but it means that it could be. Now, and I say that because the PAL, the actual priority license is only effective when it's being used. So if, if a, let's say Dish Network, uh, Dish Network won a lot of licenses. Verizon won a lot of licenses across the United States. Um, but Dish Network owns, uh, you know, a couple of channels in almost every county in the U.S. They bought widely, uh, but not very many. That said, they may not be using it in your area, uh, or they may not use it for several years in your area. If they're not using it, and you're not right next to them or, or have the potential for interference, then you're allowed to use those channels. They don't go away. They're not warehoused. It's, it's a device against spectrum warehousing uh, is, what, is what they did. So you... If, let's say it's a big county and you have the, the license holder is using it up in the northwest corner of that county, in the southeast corner, you may be far enough away that it's not going to cause interference and you can actually reuse those channels. So don't so, despair that the PALs are, are taken in your area. Uh, you still will have some spectrum to play with. Now, as far as comparing it to the Part 90, again, in Part 90, you only had 50. In Part 96, you have 150, of which 70 could be used 
as a priority for someone else. And that means that there's always going to be at least 80 megahertz available. Now that has to be shared and it's shared automatically using the spectrum access system. Were you going to say so something? I think, as I say, the, the, the strong point is, is the spectrum, you know, are we in a better or worse place? And in my mind, we're in a much better place. Um, back way in the day, there used to be a, a 25 megahertz wedge that people got to use. Then they expanded it to being 50 megahertz. So you had your upper 25 and lower 25 and some equipment can do part, some couldn't do both. But now we're looking where, where we have a full 80 to, to utilize today for everyone under GAA. And then that additional 70 megahertz that's out there that a lot of these people went out and bid on, but realistically, a lot of these aren't gonna be used. So, so you're looking at a significantly larger chunk to use before in, in a spectrum band that was really great. It had a lot of good things going for it. Now you've got all this extra spectrum and then on top of that, you've got crazy amount more power that you can transmit at. Um, so I, I think this band is, is kind of a home run. Um, and, and with that, you know, you, you mentioned you can use and all that. How does somebody control the spectrum? You know, do they choose it in the radio? Does a chat, does a SAS choose for you what bands you're using and what frequencies or how does that work? Sure. So all of the spectrum access systems, meaning Google, Federated Wireless, and Comscope, they have things, uh, tools associated with them that can help determine what spectrum is available in your given location. You can put in a location identifier and it, it can spit back through their portal uh, a quick message of at, at that moment in time, what spectrum is being used. Uh, that's sometimes useful. All, all three of them have some kind of tool like that. Uh, we also do that through CN Maestro and the tools that we have uh, embedded. Um, we also support the, the, the allowance or the, the, a good way to deploy radios by using tools in CN Maestro. Uh, we can do that through a spreadsheet tool that imports a sector at a time uh, and can help save some truck rolls and things. So when you go out there to put a radio out there, you have to have a grant in place or it will not transmit user data. So one of the things is, well, if I go out there and try to align and transmit and I don't have a grant, how does that, how does that work? So we, have, we provide some tools in, within the system to allow that to kind of almost pre-authorize uh, the radio uh, to get out there. And then when you go out there to, to actually deploy, your grant is waiting for you and you get it going and aligned and, and everyone's off and running because your grant is there. Um, to determine where you want or what frequency you're on with the system that we have in place, right? we have an access point or a, a base station, and then we have a subscriber module at the customer premise. And really the access point is the first one that gets out there. Once that has the grant, all of these subscriber modules are gonna be transmitting on the same frequency. So there's no question of determining which frequency to ask for. You know what that's going to be because that's talking to that uh, device. Um, so in terms of, you know, how do you determine which frequencies you ask for a specific amount of frequency and then the, the grant will come back and say, yes, you're given a specific amount of frequency and it tells you which channel. Uh, that could change over time because it is dynamically shared. So if you have three guys out there that want to use 10 meg or 20 meg channels each, and there's 60 megahertz available, no problem. It'll assign 20, 20, 20, everyone will be happy. Now, what happens if there's only 60 megahertz available and a fourth guy wants to come in and use uh, a, a 30 meg channel, let's say. What, what happens is that the SAS goes back and determines a fair use of the spectrum and it'll reallocate, it can, it can change your channel size, it can change your output power. Um, those are the two parameters that it has to, to work with to make everything fair. Now, what is fair? That's still a little bit in question, and we haven't seen a whole lot of, you know, super saturation where we're seeing a bunch of people on top of each other. By and large, there's enough spectrum right now that most operators are getting what they asked for. Uh, we are seeing some cases of interference, and there, I know I'm seeing questions come in about, you know, is the SAS actively managing the spectrum uh, to prevent interference? The answer is not yet. The SAS is not equipped to do that just yet but it will. Uh, that's part of the innovation that's going on right now as the SAS has become more mature. They, are, uh, they have the ability to take all of the in interference calculations and plot them against each other and see which, you know, which ones are the, makes the most sense. So they will help manage that. But right now they are not. Um, so they're granting 
where they see available spectrum. They are shuffling where they need to. And sometimes this requires uh, another key point of using CBRS. Sometimes this requires communication from SAS to SAS. And that happens in an overnight maintenance window known as CPAS. And I, I off the top of my head, can't remember what that stands for. Uh, but it's a, an overnight communication from SAS to SAS because all the SASs only know what's in their SAS at a given point of time. But overnight, they all talk to each other to kind of get that whole database picture. Um, so, so there may be cases where a radio cannot come on air for a full cycle of 24 hours. So I guess uh, to, to keep it on a more simplistic level, there's a lot of Blow the whistle, Benton. <laughs> You're on mute, by the way. There you go. <laughs> I don't want to blow the whistle. I think this is just going to get super annoying. So um, real quick, I just wanted to throw out um, our, uh, our winner from the first raffle, Mike R. Mike R., um, I'll be reaching out to you afterwards to get your ship to address for our goodies of cooler with all kinds of fun stuff in it. So sorry to interrupt. Continue, Matt. That's, it's all right. I just, uh, a lot of people aren't traditional Cambium users, so I want to kind of go through a little bit. So you've got the SAS, which you get your CBRS training and certification done. And that controls all of the frequencies of all of the three gigahertz radios all over the United States. And then Cambium has their product that exists in the CBRS portfolio, which is your 450 product line, which has, you know, the, the 450M access points, 450I access points, and the 450B subscribers. And then you have your cloud management um, or on-premises management. Sorry, I burnt my hand there. Um, and that is essentially it manages your entire network and that's called CN Maestro, but then that also does all the interfacing with the SAS. And so the idea is, is that Cambium solution is the simplest and most elegant way to, to easily get into CBRS at this time. Um, you know, what are some eye-opening moments that you've seen that, that, you know, really leads to the simplicity and why you guys developed it that way? I think if you don't have what we use, what, what they know, what is known as the domain proxy, uh, the mm -hmm. domain proxy is the module by which the radios talk through this proxy to the SAS. Uh, so, and it's a cloud-based uh, system. So basically the, the access point, the base station receives information from the CPEs that are attached or the SMs that are attached. And then that AP transmits through Maestro through the domain proxy to the SAS and back. And so that, that messaging is a constant uh, heartbeat. It has to have a constant heartbeat. If a radio does not make that messaging back and forth, within five minutes, it goes off air. And we've seen you know, a couple instances, you guys may be aware, but there's been a couple instances where significant internet interruptions like Cloudflare issues with DNS resolution, things like that have caused uh, you know, a momentary outage. And it's, it's because this cloud communication is, is necessary for operation in the band. Um, but that said, the simplicity is in the fact that the radio handles all of this uh, through Maestro. So you put it up, you deploy it in Maestro, you enter the CPI credentials for the entire sector in a spreadsheet that's saved, that's uh, locally available. And then once all that's done and the, and the grant is received, you're done with that involvement. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy once it's entered and, and there uh, to manage. Uh, it's all there. Now, it, it, again, if it changes because of parameters or local environmental issues, you'll be notified uh, through Maestro, uh, but it, and, and it could change. But that's certainly um, an easy way to do it. And your product that you have, the, the 450 platform is, you know, a, a, a stable product that's been out for a very long time. And it's, you know, multi-generations been in use for, I think, 15 plus years now with, with the same, you know, uh, basic hardware. Um, but obviously you guys are making a lot of advancements moving forward. Um, you know, a lot of people I talk to, we get on the phone and we're like, Hey, you know, well, I'm, I'm looking to do CBRS and I'm considering LTE and I'm also looking at Cambium's platform. And, you know, one of the things I, I like to mention is that, you know, LTE you know, all this wasn't inherently designed for fixed wireless broadband out of the gate. You know, it's designed for, for mobile, for roaming, and, and there's a lot of complexity to that. Where are some things that you feel your product shines um, in its ability to outperform, you know, an LTE standards-based solution? So this is a good topic to spend a couple minutes on. So the, the, the band CBRS is often equated with LTE. Uh, most, most folks that think of it that don't know Cambium exists 
they'll say CVRS is LTE. And, that, and that's the end of the conversation. Um, that's, I want to make sure that people understand that's not the case. So our platform, the 450 platform, is a software-defined radio. It is not LTE. It was the originally the only protocol that was not LTE uh, written into the rules. Since, since launch, there's been a few others uh, that have come around. Um, but most of the, the, the protocols that are allowed in Part 96 are 3GPP related protocols. Um, that said, and, and one other point that I see a question that came in from one of the audience members is that, uh, you know, can you play nice or can you co-locate with LTE equipment? The answer is absolutely yes. The 450 has a frame structure that's very configurable. And we have a white paper and some tools, uh, frame calculation tools available that can help uh, mimic or, or co-locate best with LTE equipment. We can mimic the like frame configuration and subframe configuration to match the timing of the LTE equipment so that, yeah, absolutely, we can co-locate with that. We have people doing that today. We had people doing that under Part 90. Now we have people doing it under CBRS. So that's, that answers that. Um, the other thing, as far as, you know, why we think 450 has some advantages here, it is a purpose-built fixed wireless solution that's capable of much more capacity. Uh, we do right now eight by eight multi-user MIMO with Medusa in this band, uh, and it's functioning very, very well. Because the power levels are increased uh, with CBRS, uh, we can do every bit as good as LTE in terms of range and coverage. And we now get the benefit of the multi-user MIMO capability, especially in the uplink. So with the 450B high gain dishes uh, that yeah. are available, there's a little bit higher power available and it's got that high gain uh, dish antenna. Those two things combined means you have a huge amount of uplink available to you as well. LTE systems by and large, because of the frame structure, because of it's coming from that mobile standard, they're very limited in how much uplink they can provide. Uh, so when you talk about a 20 megahertz channel and a two by two scenario with LTE, you're talking maybe 105 megs, something like that in certain frame configurations, uh, about 10 of that, 10 megs is in the uplink. That's about as much as you're going to get. Uh, whereas you can really configure that to the best uh, or optimal scenario, however you'd like with the duty cycle frame, you know, in the uh, 450. There's a huge amount more uplink available to you if, if you so choose to do that. So that's just a couple of the advantages uh, that I believe 450 has. And then so, you know, field results from what I see and hear talking to people is, you know, people are able to put a ton of subscriber modules on this access point. You know, we're talking over a hundred, have great non-line of sight performance. And with that massive MIMO talking to multiple subscribers in that exact same frame allows you to have, you know, an access point that, that spectral efficiency can't be matched by anything else in existence. Um, and so, you know, the way we look at it is it's, it's, it's a more expensive radio and we understand that. But when you look at the dollar per megabit that you're using to service these people, it's by a factor less expensive when you start getting more dense. And I, 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 if you don't mind, I'd like to take this time to address a couple of things that people point out as disadvantages uh, with yeah. regards to 450 versus LTE. Uh, one of those things is what they call N equals one or the ability to reuse the same frequency throughout the network. Uh, LTE has done this um, in a couple of different ways. Generally speaking, they do it in a three sector deployment. Uh, so they'll have 320 degree sectors. Uh, generally speaking, that's a shamrock type of shape. It's not round uh, in terms of coverage pattern uh, because they're really using like 60 degree antennas in that 120 degree sector and you have pretty severe roll off in between the sectors. Uh, but you're able to do N equals one because it has this uh, capability to move resource blocks and only utilize them for one sector versus another. Now, when I say N equals one, it's not 100% reuse. It's always a fractional reuse. They call it FFR. Um, and there's only a, a fraction of the bandwidth available for reuse among those three sectors. So don't think about it as n equals one. It's not quite the same as n equals two in our system. So we can do uh, frequency reuse in an A, B, A, B type of fashion, n mm -hmm. equals two. So I can use the same frequency back to back and I get 100% efficiency by doing that. Um, so it's a little bit different. Yes, you need another channel, but it's a, it's a, 
in my mind, a, a more efficient manner. A and it's a better coverage pattern from a, a it's more round uh, than it is a shamrock shape or clover leaf shape uh, because our antennas are designed to cover a 90 degree sector, not a more narrow sector that's being used as a wider sector. So a couple of points there. The other, that's, that's one thing. The other thing that LTE talks about a lot um, is carrier aggregation. Uh, this is one area that's pointed out as well. A uh, 450 doesn't have carrier aggregation, so we won't be able to use CBRS. I'd like to uh, call that a myth, busted, whatever you want to say there. Um, flag on the play. I'm, I'm using <laughs> phrases that go with the football theme, Ben, you see? Doing a so, good job, Matt. Uh, back, back to the, the point. Uh, carrier aggregation is a great thing to have. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it's really only necessary in CBRS. It's only necessary where you may have a PAL and you may have a PAL that's not big enough to be the whole channel. Meaning, let's say you have one 10 megahertz chunk. In a 10 megahertz channel, you may want to have uh, a higher capacity than that's able to give you. For 450, for instance, you're only going to get, you know, 60 megs, maybe 100 megs if you're doing good with multi-user MIMO out of that guy, out of a 10 megahertz channel. Um, but you may want to use something bigger than that. If you have a PAL and it's assigned somewhere low in the channel and your remaining uh, ability to use channels is in GAA, it may be separated uh, between those two channels because there may be other PALs assigned in between. That's the only scenario where carrier aggregation really helps. Uh, otherwise, you can have a 20 meg channel here, a 20 meg channel there, do AB, AB with those and be perfectly happy uh, doing that. Um, that said, we are looking at ways to implement carrier aggregation, and we've committed to doing that by the end of next year uh, on the 3 gig 450M platform. So we are doing that, uh, and we'll be able to support two carrier aggregation in a 20 or a 40 meg channel, a 10, 20, or 40 meg channel. So that's, that's the goal um, for the end of next year. So that's kind of those two, uh, those two knocks on 450. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the we've had, we've had discussions around them and, and how do we address them? And those are the, the solutions that we've come up with. All right. And I'm going to uh, just keep the goalposts moving as they like to say, we, uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw out our second poll question real quick. Uh, again, this is another raffle. So throw it out. Everybody get a quick second to answer it. Um, and we'll keep it moving as far as the conversation goes. Um, stick to the game plan. Don't fumble. Um, you know, no Hill Mary's at the end kind of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and throw that one up and all right. And um, one of the things, Matt, you touched on it earlier. Um, I would like to get a little bit deeper, not even deeper as much as just a clarification. What happens when a, um, the SAS is down? So whether it be an outage or whatever it might be where the heartbeats are not able to uh, make it back to the SAS, um, what happens in that scenario? So after five minutes goes by, the radios stop transmitting. There's no way around that. If a, so if you're, let's say you choose federated wireless, if federated wireless's system goes down and that heartbeat message does not go back and forth, then you lose the, the radios will stop transmitting. Uh, so that, that's, I mean, that's a black and white that's written in the rules. If, if it can't reach the SAS for whatever reason, uh, you have a power outage at the site or you have something going on with your network, uh, that, that result is the same. If five minutes goes by and there's no communication back and forth from the SAS to the radio, the, the radio stops transmitting. Now, that doesn't mean the grant goes away. That means it's, it's suspended. Uh, it stops transmitting. But as soon as it reestablishes that heartbeat connection, it comes back up and starts running again. And that grant lasts for us up to seven days. So you can be suspended or, or in a state of disconnection for up to seven days and, and still come back immediately without having to re-register anything. Um, so there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of, lot of nuances in how the operations work and things that you'll have to learn as you, as you go. Uh, but that's, that's the black and white answer to that question. So is, is there any backup SAS or can you register for multiple SASs? So at this moment, no, um, that's not really allowed. Uh, there's no method of doing more than one SAS. Uh, we're looking at ways to implement something like that, uh, but at this point, there's no method to do that. You can't, a single, what they call CBSDID, which is a unique identifier for that radio, 
uh, a single CBS DID can only exist in one SAS at a time. Now we're looking at, you know, potential, if you really want to do something like that, if you don't believe that this SAS is strong enough versus that one, uh, we're looking at a way to do that in the background and then have that ready to go kind of, and, and I don't know if you want to call it a hot swap to the next SAS, something like that, but we have not uh, gone down that road yet. As far oh, as handoff that. would have been a perfect play handoff. there. You should have gone oh, straight to handoff. Yeah, sure. uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, real quick, the uh, second winner for our raffle, Devin K. Devin K, I'll be getting your contact information from you, and uh, we'll get some stuff out to you. So continue, guys. So today, um, I guess, more of a high level, which SASs does Cambium's portfolio support? So we support the big three, again, uh, Federated Wireless, Google and Comscope, all three of them. Uh, we just recently brought Comscope on, but they're avail they're an available choice now in the uh, okay. in CN Maestro. I think so I just any found of those out three. The other day. What's that? I've just found out about that one the other day. So yeah, I just yeah. We made a press release uh, last month, and we just got them onboarded uh, about a month ago, about about six weeks ago. And they've been around forever doing this, so they're uh, yes. So all three companies, we we love having them as partners. Um, we, uh, again, we allow the choice up to the, the operator. The operator can choose any of those three. The cost, let's touch on the cost while we're talking about this. So there's a cost to doing business in this band. Um, there are a couple of those companies, uh, and I, I guess I can name them because they put it on their website, but Google and Federated Wireless both are saying they cost you know $2.25 per link per month uh, okay. to operate a, a radio on their SaaS. We charge $3 per SM per month. So basically the same uh, method uh, per link price. You don't pay anything for the base station, uh, but you're paying on a per link price. We charge a little more than those guys uh, at a uh, base level. And that's because we're taking care of that digital certification of the hardware, which would be required um, via our proxy. So the proxy being there and facilitating that communication as well as all the tools and, and stuff we provide from the CN Maestro and how it gets deployed and managed, uh, we're taking care of all that, which is why it costs a little bit more uh, for us to, to manage that. Um, there is no option to do it without Maestro. So if you're entering, if you're using Cambium equipment, you're entering into a business relationship with Cambium, we will bill you directly. Uh, we now have the ability to support uh, credit cards, uh, auto debit through a credit card or an ACH routing information. So that's, that's the way you sign up. And you do all this through Maestro right when you sign up for, for using CBRS. And so I guess, you know, the last question I really have on this. So the customers don't have to actually talk to anyone at the SAS or open tickets or anything like that. All the communication goes through Cambium. Absolutely. That's another point and a great point that, to bring up is all the support uh, for this. If you have an issue communicating with something, if you have an issue with the SAS itself, if you have an interference issue, you come to us. Uh, we will help facilitate that. We have relationships with all three SASs. So we can have those, we can bring those guys together at a moment's notice and say, hey, we can help resolve this for you. Um, and, and the beauty is that it's all the same path, uh, meaning it all goes through Maestro. It's all done the same way, regardless of which SAS you pick. Now, when you do sign up with a specific one, you do gain access to their portal directly. Um, and some of them have, you may, you may be asking the question, well, which SAS should I choose and why? <laughs> uh, that's a common, commonly asked question. And again, we like to be agnostic. We like to make sure that all of our partners are treated equally, uh, but some may have different tools available than others. Uh, so some can have a, a really nice spectrum inquiry tool. Some of them are, are um, touting what's called same day grant. They're, they have the ability to maybe pre-clear a specific area uh, so they don't have to wait for CPAS necessarily. Um, some of them have planning tools, network planning tools. And we'll talk a little bit about CN Heat and our network planning tool in a little bit, I'm sure. Uh, but some of them have different tools available. So you, you gotta kind of evaluate what you like to see. Um, you can even go in some of them, you can sign up for the portal prior to getting uh, to, to signing up through Cambium. But when you do sign up, through Cambium, you will get access to that company's uh, portal, uh, which may have additional information as well. Have any of the SASs been more reliable than others as far as heartbeats and, and connectivity and uptime? 
so the, the good thing is that the wind forum rules are the same for everybody. So theoretically, if they didn't have these add on things, uh, peripheral tools and things, all of them would be exactly the same. And so the good news is they all function properly. Uh, we haven't had issues with any of them uh, that I can speak of. You know, some folks have noticed an outage here or there with, with one or two of them. And we've worked very closely to resolve those and make the system more robust. And again, I do want to point out Cambium Network's radios are a huge percentage of the market right now uh, in CBRS. You know, it's, it's a big part of what's going on in CBRS. Um, and we've interacted again with all three of the SASs. So we have probably the most experience operating in this band um, and have resolved a lot of these startup type of issues already. Uh, so I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is that all three are reliable, all three are robust, and we're making them more so by interacting with all of them. Uh, so and we share, we share information between them. So that's a good thing as well. I'd like to kind of change gears a little bit because there's a couple more things I want to hit on that are a little bit, uh, you know, on different topic. Um, sure. I get a lot of questions, you know, the PAL auction's over, you know, but, but there's this new auction coming up, C-band. How, how is that going to affect me? Can you... Uh, Kind of give a little bit of your opinion on C-band and, and briefly talk on it. Sure, sure. And again, this is going to be Matt's opinion, uh, not a, an official position from anyone. But uh, so C-band, when, when we talk about C-band, there's a couple of different things going on right now with uh, the three gig spectrum. So we have CBRS. That's pretty well established. We know the rules. We know what's going on there. That's what this you know webinar is all about. There's sure. a band below uh uh, CBRS, 345 to 355. There's 100 megahertz of spectrum down there. The FCC is now talking about opening that up. They're talking about auctioning it. There's not a lot decided about that. That's a little bit further away. Um, but, you know, while it would be logical and while WISPA is pushing, WISPA is actually pushing to lobby for this to be, you know, part of CBRS because it makes sense. It's contiguous with it. It's yeah. right there. Why not, right? Uh, allow more people to use it. But I don't think that's going to happen. It looks like that may not happen. I, I would love for that to happen, but I don't know if that's going to happen. So they may auction that off for, you know, big money. We don't know. Above CBRS from 3.7 to 3.98, that's a, what's known as the C-band or the mid-band. Uh, that's prime spectrum. And that auction has already been set. It's known as auction 107. That's uh, if you Google FCC auction 107, you'll find all kinds of information about it. Now that's going to be auctioned in 20 megahertz channels and by what they call PEA, partial economic errors. These are much larger than counties. So not only is it double the channel size, it is now a much larger than a county. PEAs are what the mobile guys typically are used to bidding on. Um, and I think the amount of money that these are going to go for is a significant tenfold or more uh, than what the PALs went for. So if you think you have a chance at it. Uh, I'm all for it. I, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for any, um, anyone beyond the tier one carriers to get access to those channels. And then uh, I think when you kind ahead. of look at some of the results of the, the PAL auction, you see a little bit of like some telltale signs that, you know, you've got those PALs and the C-band buds up right next to that. And you can see that, you know, Verizon, Obviously, it's public information. They, they, they went big and they won a lot of the spectrum. And, you know, part of making that spectrum there much more useful is butting it up and having it being part of that C band and be able to use those very close to each other. Um, you know, you look at the other carriers, uh, Sprint and T Mobile, they, they've got their band 41 um, that they're, they're utilizing heavily today, but Verizon doesn't have that much of the mid band spectrum. So it seems like this is almost part of their land grab for that, that mid band. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think Verizon is going to be big in the, the C-band auction as well. Um, and there may be a couple others that, uh, that throw their hat in the ring. But that's, again, it's not the same rule set. It's not going to be the same rules as the PALs were. And I think it'll be difficult uh, to obtain spectrum in, the, in that C-band. Now, that all, all of that said, the 450 platform product does work up until 3.9 gigahertz. And it it meets the requirements for the use in that band. Uh, so the power levels allowed in that band are much, much higher, but the radio that we have, the, the 450 Medusa radio uh, does operate 
within the rules and can operate in that band, just like it would in CBRS. So it can get up to those power limits that CBRS allows, but not the elevated power that the mid band allows. Um, so if you're interested, if you do win, awesome. And we will support you up to 3.9 gigahertz uh, and support you in a way that's very similar to what you're doing in CBRS. So that, that's all of that said, uh, that's, that's going on there too. Something else I kind of want to make sure to highlight, you know, I, I kind of consider this like a cambium hack right now is that you guys are running your, your CBRS promotion and it gives customers a 50% discount on the 450M, the, the multi-user MIMO, the 450i uh, radio, which is your other access point and the subscriber modules. And, you know, a lot of people I talk to, they're like, oh, it's, it's so expensive, but you have a 450i limited in CBRS on the promotion that you can get for $799.20. And you, your CBRS compliant unit for that super low price point is able to be used in a rural area to get, you know, up to 20 people on it. And that, that kind of seems like a real big home run where, you know, maybe you don't have the density uh, that demands, you know, for that, that high end, super high power um, and, and high customer product of the 450M where you, you can start out with the 450i product, the access point, and, you know, service up to 20 people for that very low price point. So you can start doing more micro pops and access points closer to the subscribers, but all of them use that same subscriber module. So you could even have more of a, a graduation system where you work up to the Cambium access points and have your, you know, your customers be the one paying for your growth and your network upgrades. Yeah, yeah, good point. There's uh, there, the ability to get into the platform is, it's a low bar. Uh, you can start small and grow as you need. And that's kind of our philosophy from the beginning uh, has always been. So you start, start where you can and grow as you need up to and including the Medusa product that can do high density and high capacity and high spectral efficiency. Uh, All right, guys. Need, we start there. Go ahead, Brian. We, uh, we obviously could, I think an hour, I think we've proven an hour is probably short for this topic. I mean, we could go for days, um, but we do have a bunch of questions. I'd like to try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, we were supposed to kind of start this a couple minutes ago, but I wanted to let you guys finish your thoughts. Um, so I, I think a lot of the questions right now is max power and bandwidth. Um, now, obviously I know um, your, your capacity, your bandwidth is going to differ from customer to customer, but you know, Real life, what can you expect on a 450 platform as far as um, uh, bandwidth and then what's your maximum output power for each one? So, so the max output power allowed by CBRS band uh, varies with channel size, uh, but it starts at 47 dBm. So you, in a 10 megahertz channel, it's 47 dBm. In a 20 megahertz channel, it's about 3 dB higher, 50, megahertz, uh, 50 dBm. So our radios get very, very close to that, if not right on. Uh, at both ends, meaning uh, the, the 450M and the 450B high gain. Uh, both of them get very close to that, that limit, those limits. You can operate in a 10, 20, 30, or 40 meg channel. Uh, it's up to your choice and whether that spectrum is available. So you can ask for what you need to operate in. Um, in, the, in terms of bandwidth and what people are actually seeing, I did a webinar last week, last week, and we had a guest on there, uh, Dave Milholland from Wireless, et cetera. He's doing great things with uh, 30 meg channels and 20 meg channels. And so you can see some examples uh, on our forums. So you can go check out the, the webinar I did. And there's, there's a lot of examples out there. A lot of folks are doing great business uh, for them using 20 meg channels. And you can do that here and you can do that there. You can do a N equals two, A, B, A, B, and use those same 40 megahertz throughout your network. Um, so it's a kind of a nice uh, channel planning capability. And distance wise, as far just to give you a, a couple more data points, distance wise for three gig at those power levels, you're talking about, you know, four or five miles, um, even eight or 10 miles at line of sight. But, but if you have some trees, you got to get through, you can shorten that distance a little bit, but you can get pretty far and get decent modulations, which means you have, you know, more bandwidth to play with. Um, so it's, it's a good amount of data getting through a good amount of um, foliage, if you will. Um, so lots of, lots of good stuff going on in the band uh, today. Uh oh, I lost Benton. I think you're. Oh, so CN Heat is Cambium's tool. And they just came out with that feature to be able to do non line of sight prediction models using yeah. very accurate LIDAR data down to a meter. 
And so I want to make sure everyone understands that the Cambium has a utility that, that you can utilize and it pay for, and it'll let you very accurately model non line of sight predictive analysis on this product. And the data is super accurate. And so you're going to see almost, you know, to, to a high degree of accuracy, your, your predictive model on that product. And it's saving our customers a lot of time on installs, knowing exactly where to go, but specifically knowing where they should and shouldn't even bother rolling those trucks at those. Yeah, we, we, uh, on that note, so we, we had CN heat available for five gigahertz in a lot of different products. Uh, we've now extended the capabilities to do near and non-line of sight, as Matt mentions. And we actually have a lot of people now doing the predictive and the, the heat mapping in advance of potentially entering a market and to help them with their RDOF applications, as a matter of fact. So if you're applying for money from the government, you got to kind of have a good plan behind it. Uh, people are buying CN Heat today to think about what kind of plans they can offer customers in what areas um, for those kinds of, uh, you know, supplements. Um, and that's something that we, we as a distributor are doing day in and day out is helping people with network design for their RDOF applications. Sure. So any questions, definitely reach out to us. We have a lot of experience. We've helped people get all the, the correct documents together to, uh, to, to be allowed to uh, go on that bit. I, I see a couple of questions about the, the pricing and I want to make sure that that's clear to everybody. So I, I mentioned $3 per SM. That includes the fee for the SAS. Uh, we, you, uh, the customer will pay Cambium. Cambium will turn around and take care of the SAS fees. Um, so it's not on top of whatever the SAS is charging. It's in lieu of the, the SAS charges. Just want to make sure that that's clear. And real quick, the uh, we'll try to fire through as many of these questions. Can I go rapid fire here real quick with you, Matt, if you don't mind? Yeah, not at all. Um, how do we find out which frequencies are still available in our area? And I guess to kind of piggyback, is there an accurate mapping of Spectrum license owned yet? So, so again, the as far as the licenses go, there is a database. It's rather big and cumbersome because there's, you know, 6,000 counties or whatever. Uh, but there is the FCC published uh, who won the auction and how much they paid for every every license in the U.S. So you can go into that database and check it out in your area. You know, you look up by, by name the county that you're interested in. It'll show you who's got the licenses. Now, PALs are not a specific chunk of frequency. It's only a marker to assign 10 megahertz to that owner. Uh, that's all it is. Uh, so those PALs have not been decided exactly which frequency they're in. There will be discussion, I'm sure, about what that what that is, exactly which frequency. Once they've established it, I don't think you'll see them move very much, um, but there's going to be some negotiation ongoing uh, when that gets to that point. That said, do, the PALs are out there, and you can look up who, who's got what. Do any of the SAS systems assist in keeping GAA users from interfering with each other? So I, I kind of covered this one earlier, but the not yet. They're not uh, really measuring and um, and applying any knowledge or any uh, insight or any intelligence to the management of the spectrum they're simply assigning channels uh, based on what's what they perceive as available if it causes interference right now it's a manual resolution of that interference and so some people are running into this uh, but again this will get better uh, they're they're implementing what they call coexistence groups uh, which will help manage this in an automated fashion uh, that that is coming, but as to when it gets implemented, we're talking about you know three to six months. Some SASs may be faster than others, and and it's an ongoing uh, process. What is the protection level given to a PAL user in RSSI? Uh, I believe it's minus eighty six at a given distance away, and minus eighty six dBm. But there's there's a rules established for this, and we can talk about that with a SAS directly if you'd like. Um, but that's, that's a pretty specific question. And this one you kind of touched on earlier, but um, how do you aggregate PALs and 10 megahertz channels uh, that have been awarded through the GAA 10 megahertz channel auction? Uh, must, we heard that it must be contiguous using the PMP 450, but not with LTE equipment. So if you want more than one PAL, you'll get them together. That is uh, hands down the answer. Um, so if you, win, if you won four PALs in an area, you'll get 40 megahertz continuous chunk. That is, there's no reason in any scenario to not do that. Um, that said, that the one scenario where carrier aggregation may help, and, and that's, I think, where this question is coming from, is where you have a 10 megahertz chunk of PAL, and you want to use a 10 megahertz or more chunk of GAA. 
how do you combine those two? The answer is carrier aggregation, but that's the only scenario where that uh, is necessary. Okay. Um, I've actually heard this one a couple of times, so I, I'm curious, but can you explain how SAS addresses DPA when naval ships come into port? Uh, how does yeah. SAS move PALs to accommodate the Navy? We didn't uh, cover DPAs too much, but on the coastal areas, back in the part 90 days, they were known as exclusion zones and you weren't allowed to use it at all on, along the coast uh, for a specific you know, amount of distance inland. Now they have what they call DPAs or dynamic protection areas uh, that are mandated by the government and they're all along the coasts and in a couple other locations and for fixed satellite stations, there's some DPA areas as well. Those areas are triggered sometimes uh, by events and sometimes by naval radar events that cause you to vacate a specific channel. Now, there's what they call ESCs, environment, Environmental Sensing Capability Networks out there. Google and Comscope co-own one of them. Federated Wireless owns their own. Uh, they're both out there in the same areas and they're both almost 100% active meaning they've got almost the whole uh, coastline covered, the Continental 48. Um, that said, there's a refinement going on about you know, when those get triggered, how they get triggered. Uh, we have seen some issues. Hurricane Laura, for instance, took out a couple of sites uh, that caused some issues uh, with DPAs down in the Gulf. Uh, there's, there is going to be learnings and ongoing uh, things with that. All of the SASs are working together to make that the best experience possible for the operator because that affects uh, how folks on the coast can use the, the equipment. So that's a, it's an important point. We didn't really have time to touch on. So um, we're gonna go into overtime. Um, for anybody that uh, has to jump off, we greatly appreciate you joining us. Our final winner, uh, Scott S. for our final raffle. Again, our three winners, uh, we will reach out and get your information. Um, for anybody that wants to stick on, we're going to sit on for just a couple more minutes to try to answer a couple more questions. Uh, Matt, if you got a couple extra minutes, we'd love to try and knock some of these other ones sure. out. Um, again, if you have to jump off, totally understand. We appreciate your time. This will be uh, posted on our YouTube page, and we will have um, uh, copies of the recording uh, sent out to anybody that, that attended. So we do appreciate it. Um, all right, so a couple other questions here. Um, I saw a good one. Oh, can we manually remove CBRS from the AP and assign it ourselves? Uh, no. Uh, if you're operating in this band, you are using the SAS. There is no other option. Uh, today and until October 17th, which is, you know, 32 days away, um, you can drop back to part 90 and operate in part 90 with our equipment. That's that, that is possible, uh, not recommended, but possible. And there was, you know, a couple of hiccups, as I mentioned early on, and some people did that. They dropped back to part 90 and were operating in part 90 until they got the, the grants reestablished and back up and running. Uh, once that goes away, that back fallback option, there is no other option. You must operate in part 96. You have to communicate with the SAS. The SAS will assign the channel and you'll be off and running. There's no way to pull it out of, of SAS communication without losing the ability to transmit. So yeah, you, you're playing by the rules once you're uh, once you're in this band. Um. Okay, I, a couple more questions. The clarifications of of the payment because I, I do see two or three more people that have asked um, after we'd explained it. If you don't mind running up, so it's three dollars per SM for the SAS management to Cambium, and that rolls in your SAS payment as well, correct? Yeah, so the, the three bucks is the all-in cost for the Cambium support and the Cambium tools and the SAS. So it's all one one charge and that we cover everything. That, that's okay. it. Um, I, I do see some other questions about billing. So I'll, I'll address those while we're talking about that. Uh, if you do have an agreement directly with the SAS already, like say you use somebody else, not Cambium, and you have an agreement with Federated Wireless, if that's the case, you do have to set up a second instance within CN Maestro and because we will bill you uh, directly uh, for the, the Cambium gear. And others, uh, a couple people ask about other SaaS providers. I think we've pretty much covered that. It is what it is now and maybe down the road we'll get some more sprinkled in. Um, realistically, I think that's a lot of it. Again, guys, I think we could do this for another couple hours. I, I, I've got... I mean, unfortunately, I could probably could do two hours of just question and answers without really you guys talking about anything else. So um, for anybody that did not get to the questions, um, please, please, please um, reach out to us directly. Uh, myself or Matt Kale will, 
format. Um, and we will be more than happy to try to answer questions that maybe we didn't get to. Um, Matt, as you're scrolling through, do you see any others that maybe we want to hit on? There's some questions about uh, DPAs that are pretty involved uh, that I really don't think we have time to answer. Um, but certainly improvements are ongoing in the band uh, in general. And I think if you're experiencing, if you've had dipped your toes and you're experiencing interference as a Cambium customer, we will help support the resolution of those interference issues. Because again, we do have relationships with all the SASs. So we know who to ask, how to ask, uh, who to contact, and we can gather those folks directly quickly and resolve those for you. Um, so right now, because it's all manual, uh, we will work on that with you uh, if you have issues with interference. That in the future, things will be more automated in terms of uh, coexistence groups and resolution of interference. So that, that's the, what you have to look forward to. The cost is mandated by the FCC. Well, not mandated by the FCC, but the cost of the, using the SAS is the ability to operate in the band. It has nothing to do with really resolving interference. That's the customer service piece that we will help uh, drive uh, with our SAS partners. Thank you, sir. Well, again, um, everybody, we appreciate you guys so much for, for joining us today. Um, you know, I, I Matt, Kale, Matt, uh, Matt M, Matt K, uh, we greatly appreciate you guys for all your information. Um, I, I think that, uh, again, I think we could have done this for two hours. And we probably still have questions left over. Um, anybody that has questions, please reach out to, to any one of us. We'll be more than happy to help out. Uh, we're going to get our raffle information out, our winners out. Um, we'll get some information from you guys. Um, other than that, I appreciate it, Matt Kale. Any uh, closing words, final? That's it. Yeah, just thanks again, Matt. All your time is appreciated. Um, and again, any additional questions that people have, reach out to us. We'll get you an answer um, or get you at least a lot more information to kind of think about on uh, all your questions you might have. No, thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Yep. All right, and um, I guess that means the buzzer went off and the Hail Mary was completed. I guess we'll finish it with that nice, cheesy uh, football reference. But, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, we will have this um, uh, recording sent out. Um, everybody enjoy the rest of your week and uh, stay safe. Go Bears. Bears. Go Panthers. Go Panthers. <laughs>